Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast, episode 116. This week, we're all about the hippie astrums. Subtitle, I love big bulbs and I cannot lie. host and plant enabler Jane Perrone. This week we're taking a look at the rather OTT Christmas bulb that is the hippie astrum, often wrongly named as amaryllis. We'll be looking at how to plant it and how to get it to flower on time and what to do afterwards so it flowers next year. So if you bought a hippie astrum bulb to plant along with mine, it's time to go and root it out of the paper bag and get ready for some potting. And I answer a question about a colocasia who's made friends with a mushroom. Is this a toxic relationship or a match made in heaven? Thanks to all of you who've responded to last week's news about our cray cray plan to get a new plant emoji out into your smartphones. And the one that everyone seems to be backing on Facebook, at least, is the Monster Relief. We had a few other suggestions. A few people backed a rosette type succulent. I was kind of thinking about a Necavaria shape. Uh, and a few people were keen on Venus flytrap. And one joker added durian as an option. Um, Google that if you don't know what it is. It's a it's a stinky fruit. I <laughs> love the idea of a durian emoji. Uh, Alex, who suggested that, but I'm not sure that that is going to fly with Unicode, who decide about these emojis and let new ones in. But I think we're definitely going to plump for the monster leaf. Good news is that we have somebody who has some graphic design expertise. Thank you, Jesse, who has stepped forward to volunteer to help with this. And I can't wait to see what she comes up with. So we may have a draft emoji for you guys to look at fairly soon. Thank you to Christina for becoming a legend this week, joining our happy clan of Patreon subscribers. Thanks to Delphonic661 and Carpafula for leaving lovely reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the show, but you don't have enough pennies in your purse to be a Patreon subscriber, then leaving a review is a brilliant way to do that. Or get all old fashioned and sit down with your friends and family and show them how to download a podcast and how to listen to On The Ledge. Because word of mouth is one of the most powerful ways that people can find out about the show. Hippie astrums are the Barry White of the indoor bulb world, massive and flamboyant, and maybe just a teeny bit cheesy, but in a good way. As amazing plants woman Anna Pavord puts it in her brilliant and simply titled book, Bulb, don't be snooty about them. They are fabulous things and the whole point of them is their ludicrous size and their ability to knock you out from the far side of a room. First, let's clear up a confusion about the name. You may be more used to seeing this plant labelled as Amaryllis, but that's actually a misnomer. Uh, That really refers to Amaryllis belladonna, which is a more refined and delicate uh, lily-like bulb from South Africa, whereas hippiastrums are from Latin America, uh, and they've been hybridised extensively to produce a huge range of the trumpet-like flowers that we know and love. And these trumpet-like flowers, well, they're on this amazing tall, meaty stem, which does, we have to admit, look rather phallic when in the bud stage of development, so do prepare yourself for that. When it comes to choosing a cultivar, it really depends on your aesthetics. There are showy, really OTT ones like the Deep Red Crimson Pearl and the frankly hideous Double White and Red Striped Dancing Queen and more subtle affairs such as the Pale Greeny White Lemon Star and the spidery cherry red and lime green lapaz. There are loads of places to buy bulbs mail order, but if you want to get started now, and you may need to do that if you want to have your bulb in flower for Christmas, it may be advisable to buy in person from a garden centre or other boutique plant shop. And when you're choosing those bulbs in person, you get the chance to choose the absolute pick of the bunch so look for the biggest bulbs that you can find and make sure you give them a good squeeze to check they're nice and firm and they've got no big splits or signs of mold or rot 
And you're also looking for a big cluster of juicy roots coming out the bottom of the bulb, which is a really good sign. If you want them to bloom in time for the festive season, it is a bit of a gamble. Most of the labels will tell you that they flower about six to eight weeks from planting time. But inevitably, it does vary a bit. It depends on the conditions you have, the cultivar you've got and how carefully you tend them. Uh, and before you get around to planting, they do need 12 to 24 hours of soaking. Now, this is quite easy. You just take a, a, a bowl or a wide vase and half fill it with tepid water and then stick the bulb in the top make sure the roots are in contact with the water and a little bit of the bulb can be underwater as well. Uh, soak them overnight or for a few hours and then they're ready to go and plant. So let's go and get my babies planted. I've got two bulbs, one red pearl, yes, the deep crimson uh, drama queen, and I've got a La Paz as well, which is the spidery one I referred to earlier. So it's going to be fascinating to see how they do. But before we start, let's just run over what we're going to need. These monster bulbs, contrary to appearances, don't need a monster pot. What you need is a pot that's just slightly larger than the circumference of the bulb. Terracotta works really, really well. You can use plastic, but whatever pot you choose, just make sure it does have drainage. And a paveboard suggests a two to one mix of multipurpose compost and grit. So I'm going to be using silver grey peat free with a few handfuls of grit added in. And make sure that your potting mix is at room temperature when you pot the bulb so it doesn't have a horrible shock from being plunged into ice cold potting mix. OK, I'm going to go off and get started. So come along and let's get these monster bulbs into their pots. Okay, here we go. So I've got my potting mix, which is nice and toasty because, as I said, you need to make sure that it's at room temperature so the bowl don't get a shock. I'm just giving it a bit of a stir. I've got my silver grow peat free with some grit and I've also added a few expanded clay pebbles as well just to make sure it's nice and airy. And typically I haven't got any spare terracotta pots right now, so I am having to use plastic and then I will put these into a cash pot. Uh, so let's get my bulbs. Let's see how they're doing. They have been soaking overnight and they now should be ready to go. Look at that. What a beauty. OK, so this is the first one is Red Pearl, which came from Peter Nissen Bulb Company. Um, if you know that firm i'll put a link in the show notes so you can find out more about them so the bulb's looking really good and i'm just going to check that the pot that i've brought in is the right size because that could be annoying yeah that looks perfect so there's about just about half a centimeter to a centimeter around the pot uh, which will be absolutely fine so i'm going to roll my sleeves up i'm wearing way too many clothes because it's so cold today and put some of my special mix in the bottom of the pot. Don't put a layer of grit or anything at the bottom because I think I've said before in the show, it doesn't actually aid drainage. It makes drainage worse. And now I've just got to slightly judge as to whether the bulb has the right amount of room or not. Let's try this. Oh no, I need to take some out. This always happens. You put too much in and then you take a little bit out guess until you get the right amount so the roots are going in squish them down a little bit try not to damage the roots because they're obviously need to get going and growing as soon as the bulb gets into the compost so that looks good I'm now going to fill in around the sides of the bulb with my compost making a jolly old mess as usual which is fine in that goes I'm just giving it a little bit of a shake and a shimmy just to make sure that the bulb gets a nice load of compost around it. And as I say, you need to have about half to two thirds of the bulb proud of the soil surface to make sure that everything is happy. Okay, it's looking okay. It's a bit of a, 
a bit of a shimmy job to get it in the right spot. But it's getting there. So this is already pre-moistened, this potting mix. I shouldn't need to do a heck of a lot of watering initially. The bulb will start to grow and then it's just a question of keeping an eye on it and making sure it doesn't dry out overly. That is looking pretty good. Just going to give the sides a bit of a push down to make sure there's plenty of compost around and so there's room for water to go in the top. But I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. This is a bright purple plastic pot so it definitely needs hiding in a cash pot. In it goes and that is looking fine and dandy. I'm going to go and get the next bulb. I need to make sure I label them so I know which one is which. And now we have Lapaz which already has signs of new roots on it so that's good. I'm going to put these bowls of dirty water to one side and start on this one. The roots on this one are really quite long so just be as careful as you can not to damage them and I'm going to start filling this one and when you buy that bulb just as I say make sure that it's nice and fresh it doesn't feel at all squishy sometimes you buy these and they're in sealed boxes where you can't see what the bulb is like if you're buying those kind of for a very low price then that might be a worthwhile gamble but don't buy an expensive bulb that you haven't actually got your hands on uh, if you buy mail order, it's pretty reliable. Usually good companies will send good bulbs. But if you're buying in person, it's always wise to have uh, your eyes on what you're buying. Okay, go in there. Get in there. Wolfie's often great encouragement from the sofa, where he is installed as usual. Okay, let's have a look at this. This is looking good. It's feeling quite firm in the pot. There's a bit of room at the top for water and I'm happy with that. So that is my two Hippiastrum bulbs planted and uh, now I just need to go and wash my hands and let's talk about how to make sure these things come into beautiful flower. back in the office and let's talk about how to get a lovely thick bud on your hippiastra. Mine have been put into my glass roofed conservatory which is north facing but gets tons of natural light so they should be absolutely fine there. It's probably about 18 degrees in there in the day maybe up to 20 and then it's about probably 17 at night so that should be absolutely fine the ideal conditions are meant to be 21 degrees centigrade so if you've got uh, the average living room they'll be absolutely fine with that they may be a little bit slower in my slightly cool conditions but that's okay because we've got eight weeks to go till christmas so hopefully that will fit in perfectly well fingers crossed so you're looking for somewhere that's not too drafty make sure that the compost is nice and damp but not soaking wet and now it's the waiting game and once that stem starts appearing then the one thing you do need to do is turn the pot because otherwise you end up with a drunken hippiastrum that looks like there has been some terrible disaster and is leaning at a jaunty angle so turn the pot about well every day you could just turn it a quarter turn if you can remember um, and that way you get a nice straight stem and depending on how long that stem turns out to be, you might need to put a stake in there just to keep it straight. But hopefully if there's enough light, you won't need to do that. And when the buds start bursting open, that is the point to ideally move your plant to a slightly cooler place so that the flowers last as long as possible. But let's face it, you want this plant somewhere where you can see it so you can appreciate the incredible flowers. So yeah, maybe we just go for the short, sharp shock of the Hippiastrum flowers for a few days and keep it somewhere nice and prominent in our homes. And one of the weird things about this bulb is that the flowers appear before the strap like leaves. So don't be alarmed if you get uh, the stem forming, but no leaves, the leaves will follow. And once the big show's over, what do you do then to get your bulb to flower next year? Well, there's loads of different advice on this, 
The main thing is to just water and feed them once they've flowered and keep those leaves going so that they can feed the bulb. You could do this by keeping them in exactly the same spot or maybe by moving them outside. If you happen to have a greenhouse, they could go in there as long as it's a shaded spot. And then you'll find that in late summer, around September time, they start to sort of die back. And at that point, you can just cut out the watering entirely and allow the leaves to, to shrivel away. And at that point, then they can just be left for about two months next to the garden shed or somewhere. Just forget about them. Just make a note to remember them once you get to sort of this time of year before it gets too cold outside, perhaps mid-October we're talking about that's when you need to bring them back inside, start the watering again and start feeding them again. And then hopefully they will come back into flower. And you know what, if that, if that doesn't work, you can always just buy some more and try some different varieties. I will keep you posted about how my hippiastrums do. Uh, I hope they'll be successful. We shall see. Uh, and we'll have some dramatic flowers to look at come Christmas time. But let me know if you're growing hippiastrums, which varieties you've chosen and how you're getting on with them. Because these drama queens definitely deserve a place in the spotlight. And now it's time to hear about this week's sponsor. I've been trying out Natives coconut and vanilla scented deodorant and you know what it smells fantastic. If that's not for you there's a range of other enticing scents including lavender and rose and eucalyptus and mint and if you don't like any scent at all on your deodorant then you can get that too. And as well as smelling great Native deodorant works really well too. So when you strip off at the end of the day, you're not going to get any nasty surprises emanating from your armpits. Hurrah! I also love the fact that Native's products are not tested on animals and they're free from aluminium, or aluminium if you prefer, parabens and talc. So why not try Native today? For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code on the ledge during checkout. Shipping is free on all orders to the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, France and Germany. So for 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and enter the code on the ledge. I thought it was about time that we shed a bit of light on some of the fascinating people that listen to On The Ledge. So starting this week, I'm introducing a new regular, perhaps not weekly, but certainly every so often feature where I quiz somebody who listens to the show. And in my incredibly imaginative way, I've decided to call this slot Meet the Listener. <laughs> and we'll be finding out about one listener through five quickfire questions that reveal a little bit about them and their plant obsession. So I'll let my first victim, I mean interviewee, speak for himself. Hi Jane, my name's Steve. I live in Glasgow and I'm one of your Patreon supporters. Um, I have a huge interest in cacti and succulents, but also um, most other houseplants. Um, I'm a member of the committee for the BCSS branch up here in Glasgow. And um, yeah, I've been a, a big plant fan for about three years now. Question one. There's a fire and all your plants are about to burn. Which one do you grab as you escape? <laughs> uh, that's an unfair question. Uh, I would want to save all of them. Uh, but if I have to just pick one, I would pick my string of hearts as my husband bought that for me and it has a lot of sentimental value. Oh, that's sweet. Next question. What is your favourite episode of On The Ledge? Uh, my favourite episode of On The Ledge is probably the Sansevieria one with Colin Walker from the BCSS. I just found it really, really uh, informative and it opened my eyes to lots of Sansevieria that I'd never heard of before and I've got quite a collection. Question three. Which Latin name do you say to impress people? I say all Latin names. <laughs> I don't like using common names very often. Um, but the, the one that gets most reaction is the Gisneriads. <laughs> Uh, people think it sounds really funny when I talk about the Gizneriads. It sounds like some kind of uh, some kind of rich family. So yeah, Gizneriads. Love it, Steve. I gave a talk on houseplants recently, and the first question from the audience: Did you say that the African violet was a member of the gonad family? 
Anyway, enough about me. On with the next question. Question four. Crassulation, acid metabolism or gutation? Well, as a cacti and succulent enthusiast, I am always, always, always going to pick cam. <laughs> Clever choice, Stephen. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? So I would always spend that 200 quid on 20 interesting cacti because as nice as Monstera are, the prices are getting so crazy. Um, I would rather have 20 little cacti and succulents sat on my windowsill uh, or in a cold frame outside than I would one gigantic and very, very, very expensive plant in the corner. So that's Stephen. If you'd like to put yourself forward for the Meet the Listener slot, then just send me a message to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com with a bit of information about yourself. And you never know, we might be hearing your dulcet tones on the show before long. And now it's time for question of the week, which came from Taylor on Twitter. And this was one of those desperate cries for help that makes your heart beat that little bit faster. Help! I have mushrooms around the base of my colocasia. Is this a good thing? Well, Taylor, sorry it's taken me so long to answer this question. And I hope you haven't been sitting there staring at these mushrooms for the last couple of months in absolute fear of what's going to happen to your plant. I guess the first thing to say about this is that fungi are everywhere. Yes, they are a constant present in our lives. And although we don't necessarily spot them or notice their existence, sometimes because they're super small, but also because they're under the ground most of the time. Of course, the mushroom part is just the fruiting body of a fungus. We don't realise the role they play in our ecosystems. So the top line, really, Taylor, is that this mushroom or mushrooms that you've seen in the top of your colocasia pot will not be doing the plant any harm. There are thousands of different fungus species. And so identifying exactly what mushroom you have in your pot may be tricky. But one of the most common mushrooms that's found growing in houseplant pots goes by the delightful name of Leucococrinus burnbaumii also commonly known as the yellow houseplant mushroom. And this is the one that tends to turn up in pots, either in homes or in greenhouses. And the appearance of the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms, does vary, but usually it looks like one of those little parasol mushrooms that you see in, I don't know, fairy illustrations. A yellow, bright yellow or pale yellow or cream or even white little parasol that opens up as the mushroom grows and there tends to be a little cluster of them. And the reason why this likes growing in potted plants is that the conditions are exactly right. It's nice and toasty and warm and damp. And oftentimes when you have a potting soil that's got a high organic matter content, that is just perfect for these fungi to grow on because they like to feed on the organic matter that's in soil. The first thing to say is they're not competing with your colocasia because their their energy source is completely different from plants. Fungi are a totally different kingdom. They don't photosynthesize. So they get their food by breaking down matter in the soil or in leaves or on dead logs and things like that. And it's the same in the pot where they're breaking down the organic matter in your pot. Probably the safest thing to do if you find a mushroom growing in your pot is to remove it, particularly if you've got children or pets who might be likely to have a nibble. Um, This is a toxic mushroom, but that doesn't mean you've got rid of the fungus because, of course, most of it is actually occurring under the surface where you can't see it. If you're the kind of person that finds it a bit disturbing to think about fungi living among your houseplants, then get a grip because quite frankly, uh, that's what's keeping your house plants alive. Bear in mind, mycorrhizal fungi are at work in soils and helping plants to get nutrients from the soil. So fungi are really important. We really underrate their importance in the world of house plants. And if I can get an expert to talk about this in greater depth, I will do so because it's a really fascinating topic. But yeah, don't worry about fungi in the pots. If you need to remove that mushroom from the top, they may regrow, they may not. 
but they're not doing your plant any harm. The only thing I would say is if you've got mushrooms growing, it may be a sign of two things. One, that you're using potting mix, which has got a very high organic content. This can sometimes be the case if you switch away from a peat-based compost to a peat-free compost, because these tend to have a higher level of materials from, say, recycled green waste. And it's an indication that that potting mix is quite damp because fungi do like to grow in damp conditions. So think about whether the plant that you're growing is happy with that damp soil in the same way that the mushroom is happy. And it may be that you need to repot that plant in a more free draining mix, including something like a horticultural grit or sand or perlite. If you're thinking that the soil is actually rather too waterlogged, hence the mushrooms thriving, but your plant may not be. Uh, that said, your plant may be completely happy and have exactly the right moisture levels. And in that case, you won't need to do anything at all other than maybe removing those mushrooms just for safety's sake. But if you don't have any kids or pets to worry about, you could also just make them into a little feature and admire their beauty because mushrooms are incredible things in case you hadn't already got my drift on this one. And just one last thing to say about Leucococcinus burnbaumii. One of the names of this fungus in the UK is plant pot dappling, which I think is rather charming. I hope that has been of help, Taylor. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. it for this week's show i am taking a one week break next week that's november the 15th 2019 there will be no episode of on the ledge boo i know but don't worry i'll be back the following week november the 22nd with an episode on choosing plants for christmas presents and yes that does include christmas presents for yourself which in my opinion are the best kind of presents until then my friends Have a great couple of weeks. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Rash and Pidity Picara by Samuel Corwin, Chiefs by Jazar, and Overthrown by Josh Woodward, with advertising music by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra with Whistling Rufus. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details.